Okay, we're here at the Battle of Balls Bluff on the night of October 20th, 1861. A few months after First Manassas, a small federal scouting party crossed the Potomac River from Maryland to determine whether recent troop movements indicated a Confederate withdrawal from Leesburg. Advancing inland from Balls Bluff, the Federals moved past this point and crested a low ridge near the Jackson House and saw in the dim moonlight what appeared to be a Confederate camp. Upon learning of this, the Federal Commander, Brigadier General Charles P. Stone, saw a target of opportunity and quickly organized a raiding party. Five companies of the 15th Massachusetts, led by Colonel Charles Devon, spent several hours quietly crossing the river from Harrison's Island. At dawn, they marched up the path to their way to destroy and supposed an enemy camp and return to Maryland. The camp, however, did not exist. In the dark, the scouts had mistaken a row of trees for tents. By the time the air was reported to General Stone, a battle had begun. At about 7.30 a.m. on October 21st, Company K of the 17th Mississippi clashed with the Massachusetts men near the Jackson House. General Stone remained in Maryland at Edwards Ferry, and on hearing the patrol's mistake, but not yet knowing that fighting had occurred, he had ordered Colonel Edward D. Baker to evaluate the situation. On his way upriver to do this, Baker learned of the fighting from a messenger who proceeded downriver to alert General Stone. Colonel Nathan G. Shanks Evans directed his Confederate forces from an earthen fort named for him nearby on Edwards Ferry Road. By mid-morning, Evans had committed four more companies of Mississippi Infantry and three companies of Virginia Cavalry to the Balls Buff fight. Devon's men withdrew to a wood line near the Jackson House. About 12.30, the 8th Virginia arrived. Shortly thereafter, the Confederate line, now nearly 700 strong, attacked Ev Devon's roughly 650 Federal troops. The skirmish lasted perhaps an hour. Afterward, Devons withdrew to the bluff. The most serious fighting was about to begin. This battle, known as Ball's Bluff, is one of the earlier battles of the American Civil War. And though not as large as battles like Manassas and Second Manassas and Fredericksburg, Gettysburg, and some of the battles nearby in Maryland, Pennsylvania, and Virginia, it was a, a, a very important position in 1861. Today, we're going to be walking through the Balls Bluff battlefield, which is very well preserved here in extreme northern Virginia along the Potomac. Directly in front of us is the Potomac River. Now, after skirmishing with the Confederate force, the 15th Massachusetts retreats to the bluff. The 8th Virginia, coming from this direction over here, goes right in and hits the 15th Massachusetts, 42nd New York, and 1st California, 2nd Company. On their flank is the 20th Massachusetts, 6 companies, and 4 companies of the 1st California. The other two uh, companies of the 1st California would be in this area right here. And that would be between 2 and 3 o'clock on the uh, October 21st, 1861. Now, from three to five, the 18th Mississippi comes up behind the 8th Virginia and also right here in this area. Also skirmishing and fighting with the 1st California, directly in front, the 15th Massachusetts, 20th Massachusetts, one company, 1st California, 42nd New York, three companies, 20th Massachusetts, six companies, and 1st California, four companies along the Potomac River in the deep ravine area. As we mentioned in our last video, the 8th Virginia Infantry was a local unit made up of six companies from Loudoun, two from Fauquier, and one from Fairfax and Prince William counties. It was commanded by Colonel Eppa Hunton. The regiment arrived on the field about 12.30 p.m. and initially deployed west of the ridge near the Jackson's house. With the withdrawal of the 15th Massachusetts from the area, the 8th Virginia moved cautiously forward and deployed onto the battlefield the 8th Virginia Monument right there. Shortly thereafter, the right wing of the unit clashed with two companies of the 1st California Regiment advancing up the slope to the right of this location. A hard skirmish was fought on that slope around 3 o'clock p.m. The California companies took heavy casualties and fell back. Meanwhile, a misunderstood withdrawal order by Lieutenant Charles P. Tebbs 
of the 8th caused some of the men to break and run. Colonel Hunton managed to restore the order of the 8th Virginia by withdrawing the regiment a few hundred yards toward the Jackson house. The 8th got back into the fight, conducting a bayonet charge around 5 p.m., which overran the Federal Mountain Houtzers. So again, as we walk along the interpretive trail here, you can see the 8th Virginia Monument. And this is the area that the 8th Virginia charged through on the action I just spoke about in the afternoon of that day of the battle. Now the Battle of Ball's Bluff looks very much the way it does in 1861 today. And that's pretty much due to a 1861 photograph of Union soldiers of the 15th Massachusetts who returned to the site right there where that interpretive marker is and where there was two trees and they posed for a photograph. And in that photograph, you can see the Balls Bluff battlefield surrounded entirely by a wooded area, as we can see here today. And so based on that photograph, which I'll post, um, the restoration effort has been on for years to restore the battlefield to its position and look as it did in October of 1861. Well, the Federal Army crossed three pieces of artillery to Balls Bluff, two mountain howitzers from the 2nd New York State Militia, detached under Frank French, Battery I, 1st U.S. Artillery, who occupied this area for much of the afternoon, and also a 12-pounder James Rifle Cannon from Battery B of the 1st Rhode Island Light Artillery, commanded by Lieutenant Walter Bramel of the 6th New York Independent Battery. It was near today's cemetery, which is there in front of us. Being in the open, many of the artillerists were shot down and replaced by infantrymen. Sergeant Frank Donaldson of the 1st California was one of the foot soldiers who helped man a mountain howitzer, testifying to the tenacity of which they were served. He later wrote, the gun crew killed or wounded. It was being served by a few infantrymen as best they could and I assisted in filling it with stones and dirt. As with the exception of a few flannel powder bags, all ammunition had been expended. This position around here was taken by the 8th Virginia in a bayonet charge around 5 p.m. Now Ball's Bluff is a 600 yard long shale and sandstone cliff. It rises up in a shallow bell curve from two ravines approximately 300 yards north and south of where we're standing right now. At this point, it's about 100 feet high, though just to the north, which is our left, it's about 110 feet above the river. Now note that the Potomac flows due south. And as you look across the river into Maryland, which is in the distance there, you're not looking northward, as you might expect, but to the east. Directly below us, or more or less visible, depending on the foliage of the time of the year, um, the floodplain on which Union troops landed on the morning of October 21st, 1861. The landing point was just upriver, about 300 yards to the left, and the Federals worked their way down to the floodplain um, of the bluff, which winds its way up and comes near the cemetery over here. The Virginia Channel, the river, is at normal water 70 to 80 yards wide. Beyond that channel is Harrison's Island, which was picketed by Federal troops before the battle and served as a staging area during the battle. Beyond it is the roughly 350 wide Maryland Channel on the river on the other side, which is where you see several farm buildings. That's Maryland proper. Follow the horizon to the right and you'll see a water tower that marks the spot of Poolsville, the small town that General Stone's division's headquarters from August of 1861 until his arrest in February of 62. His 10,000 troops were camped in various locations, some eight to 10 miles north and south of Poolsville, as to cover the river and watch for any Confederate activity. Now this ferry crossing, Edwards Ferry, and the island, Harris's Island, was very popular during the American Civil War. And again, here in the distance, you can see the water tower in the distance with Poolsville. That is Maryland over there. These trees are in the middle of the Potomac River. If I zoom out, and I look down through the trees, you can actually see the Potomac River. I am in Virginia. That is Maryland over there where the sun is shining. 
And on October 21st, Union soldiers came in this direction. This is the bluff that the battle is named for. These soldiers had to come across the river, go down the shoreline, and then climb up 100 feet of shale rock just to get to the battlefield that's just beyond us over here. An amazing feat here in the early part of the war in 1861. This bluff and the ferry that crossed it was also used many times throughout the American Civil War. I know soldiers from the 23rd Pennsylvania uh, crossed over from Poolsville into Virginia and then back during the Pennsylvania Maryland campaigns through this area right here that we're walking on now. And as we walk along the trail, you can see the Potomac River down here on the bluff. And you can get a very uh, good idea of how difficult it was. As we come over here to the cliff, it's literally a 100 foot drop down to the Potomac River, which you can see through the trees. So again, part of the challenge, at least for Union soldiers and a Confederate advantage during the Battle of Ball's Bluff was the fact that they were on the heights on the Virginia side of the Potomac River. Now, Company D and I of the 20th Massachusetts, which was known as the Harvard Regiment, followed the 15th Massachusetts across the Potomac River, which is behind us on the bluff. In this direction, following what was hoped to be a successful raid, those two companies led by a regimental commander, William R. Lee, deployed along the bluff here and waited. They spent much of the day in the area immediately beyond this point. While waiting, Colonel Lee sent out scouting parties upriver and downriver to secure the flanks. The upriver party stumbled onto a small group of pickets of Company K of the 7th Mississippi, and a few shots were exchanged. The Mississippians withdrew and alerted Colonel Evans to the presence of Union troops at Ball's Bluff. Unfortunately for the Federals, no one from the 20th Massachusetts went forward to inform their comrades in the 15th Massachusetts that the contact had been made with the enemy. Around the mid-afternoon, the 20th became heavily involved in the main fighting, an action later described by Lieutenant Henry L. Abbott as a fight made up of charges, individual companies advance, firing, and falling back. Lieutenant Oliver Wendell Holmes received the first of his three Civil War wounds here and was evacuated from the field. During the rout of the Federal troops, Colonel Lee and Major Paul J. Revere, who was the grandson of the Revolutionary War hero, Paul Revere, were captured along with many other soldiers. Captain William F. Bartlett led a mixed group of some 80 men upriver where they found a small skiff and managed to cross into safety. This marks the spot where Edward D. Baker, Colonel of the 71st Pennsylvania Infantry, was killed in the Battle of Ball's Bluff on October 21st. 1861. Um, there was actually a poem written about his death, which Willie Lincoln recited to President Lincoln in the White House. Now, Colonel Baker is buried at the Presidio in San Francisco, California, but the memorial stone was placed here to mark what is believed the, the location of Baker's death and to honor the memory of the uni only United States Senator to have died on the field of battle. Prior to the placement of the stone, a simple wooden fence rail supported by a pile of rocks and a small sign was the only monument to Baker. So again, Colonel Edward D. Baker is the only United States Senator ever to be killed in the line of battle during the American Civil War. In the Balls Buff Battlefield are 25 graves in what is America's third smallest national cemetery. They contain the partial remains of 54 Union soldiers killed here. All are unidentified except Private James Allen of Northridge, Massachusetts, who was in the 15th Massachusetts. The majority of the Confederate dead were moved to Leesburg. Um, most of the fallen Union soldiers found on the battlefield were temporarily buried in graves, mass graves, um, in the current cemetery and the hatchet marker just to the west. Some of the dead from both sides were shipped to their home states for burial. 
But in the fall of 1865, Governor Andrew Curtin, who sought to have Pennsylvania's dead removed and returned home, individual remains could also be not identified four years after the battle. So this is the third smallest national cemetery in the United States of America here at Balls Bluff. And this is actually a national cemetery. In retrospect, the Battle of Balls Bluff was the result of a mistake. The previous evening, Captain Chase Philbrick, the 15th Massachusetts, led a small patrol across the Potomac River to determine the results of Confederate troop movements. He spotted what he thought was an enemy camp south of the Jackson farmhouse and reported it, but it was just a row of trees mistaken for tents. Because this happened, the battle happened here at Ball's Bluff, and there were 1,720 Union soldiers and 1,709 Confederate soldiers. The Union lost 223 killed, 226 wounded, and 553 captured. The Confederate Army lost 36 soldiers killed, 264 wounded, and three captured. Definitely a Confederate victory based on a Union error early in the war. Another Confederate victory early in the war. This is a fascinating battlefield. It's also one that's well-preserved and one that's protected here by the state of Virginia.